right guys so i've just finished an incredible interview with samuel bazi an ex trafigura trader and also author of this book perfectly edge in this conversation samuel explained everything about hedging how does it work how the large player use it and the type of trade that are possible when you are able to use all those type of instruments that was a very insightful conversation i mean i learned a lot of things so uh if you want to understand how the game is played at a high level <laughs> you must listen to this interview and also stay to the end of the interview because at the end samuel uh, is giving like a little gift if you want to, to buy this book all right let's dive in all right samuel so let's start uh uh, on a strong note with that, can you talk to us about uh, one of your worst trade? Sure. So, you know, like many people, I assume, uh, at the beginning of COVID at the outset, um, you know, I was getting long copper around $6,000 a ton. Uh, you know, people were having the same conversations they are now about the energy transition. So, you know, $6,000 a ton seemed like a fairly good level and uh, little did everyone know that we were going to hit, you know, multi, multi-year lows, uh, around $4,000 a ton. Um, luckily, I, I always utilize stops, um, so damage wasn't too severe, but uh, yeah, that one that one definitely hurt. But uh, and do you remember what was the lowest price at that moment? The lowest price it went to was $4,300. Um, so luckily, I was out well before then, but um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was... Around yeah, that, that's that's tough. now we are almost ten thousand US dollars. Yeah, I mean we touched, uh, we broke through ten thousand dollars a ton last yeah. week. Um, so whether we set new new levels is TBD. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, the copper situation is really. Uh, uh, I mean, we are stuck. We are speaking about shortage for years. I mean, like, now it's been five years. Uh, there is no new mine. Blah blah blah. But uh, we yeah, I mean, we'll see if it really skyrocket or not. Months have been have been low, and you know by twenty thirty, they're talking about shortages of between eight and ten million tons a year. So the price you know has to go up if that's going to be true. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, okay, cool. So Samuel, you started your career um, with Trafigura. Yeah. So you spent. 10 years there. So basically, Trafigura, if I understand you well, it's like dog years. So we could say that you have 70 <laughs> years of experience, right? Exactly. So, <laughs> um, and so how did you, why did you uh, want to work at Trafigura? How did that happen? Can you just talk to us about the, the beginning of your, of your career? Yeah, sure. So I graduated um, with an economics degree in 2008, probably worst time in recent history to graduate with an economics degree. Um, and, you know, I was doing the usual recruiter rounds and someone, one of the recruiters I was working with had placed someone at Trafigura, um, who ended up being their COO, um, of the Switzerland office and they were looking for grads and yeah, it kind of just, it just happened. I uh, had an interview, they flew me out to Switzerland and I started in operations three weeks later. Oh, so, so that was quite fast. So, yeah. so you started as an operator. So basically yeah, so I was handling moving the stuff around. Yeah. Exactly, logistics. Um, I mean, at Trafigura, um, the operations role is a lot more involved than a lot at a lot of other companies. So you're involved in finance, accounting, payments, um, and then obviously logistics and you know, moving that product from A to B. And then so you did few years uh, on the, as an operator, then you became like a trader in or how does it work? Uh, so I, yeah, I spent um, just over a year in the Switzerland office, mainly handling aluminium, but also some lead and zinc. And then I actually got transferred to our Stanford's Connecticut office. Um, and there I spent um, you know, another 18 months or so in that role handling lead and zinc primarily and then uh, an opportunity came up to move to the what they call the deals desk which is the hedging desk so handling and mitigating that risk for the physical traders uh did that for the best part of eight months and like most people's careers at Trafigura, it takes one person to leave and then uh, the next person steps up um so the role of a refined physical trader came up and then i spent the next eight and a half years trading refined lead and zinc. So, and when you said trading, it's like, so you had a book of customer that you need? You yeah, need exactly. Customer. So uh, global export, import, um, building that domestic book in the US and then at Trafigura, everything is very uh, involved with the head office in Switzerland. So making global decisions about allocations. Um, yeah. And uh, when you said refined product, so this is basically 
everything which is not concentrate. So exactly, yeah. So concentrate mined out the ground goes into a refinery smelter, produces a refined finished products, and then we were handling the trading of that refined product. All right, good. And then after Trafigura, you worked for an, another firm for a few years, right? Yeah, so I'd always wanted and had an interest in moving into the derivative markets and an opportunity came up at Greenwich Metals for me to essentially build their derivatives desk um, where I provided an internal brokerage to hedge the risk of the entire group's metal basis uh, concentrates, refined scrap and some precious and their FX risk as well. And then the main part of my job was taking uh, speculative positions on those same markets. All right. So, uh, okay, okay, cool. So you, you did really trade everything from physical yeah. to papers to uh, yeah. everything. All right, cool. And then after that, you just moved to your current position. Uh, now... Yeah, so October of last year, um, I made the decision to launch this company, uh, Perfectly Hedged LLC. I'd spent around kind of 12 to 18 months writing uh, the book and that was receiving some some good feedback um so yeah you have your copy right there. <laughs> um and you know the demand just seemed to be there i'd always noticed this gap in the market when it came to training um hedging and you know i'd been doing it for the best part of a decade at those two companies just as part of my role and yeah made the decision in october to to launch uh, the company and uh, yeah i've been doing it last seven months or so all right cool so um your company is called perfectly edge so samuel can you please enlighten us how what is edging <laughs> can sure. you have like a, a rough explanation what is that yeah so i mean hedging unfortunately is often viewed as this really complex uh subject and it, it really shouldn't be um but at the same time it is one of the most important concepts to understand if you are going to be in the commodity trading space, um, you know, it's, it's really vital to the long term survivability and profitability of companies. Um, I always liken it to a casino. So those that hedge um, are you know, mitigating that price risk. If you don't, you know, you can you can get 10 reds or 10 blacks in a row and think you're on a run. And then eventually something's going to happen. There's going to be a shot to the market and your, your profits are going to go out the window. So, you know, hedging itself is the mitigating of price risk of the underlying commodity that you trade. So, you know, often throughout my career, I've had the question asked to me, you know, we bought copper at $8,000 a ton. A month later, when we sell it, the price is $7,000 a ton. How are we making it? How are we not losing a thousand dollars a ton? And you know, hedging is the simple answer to that. And you know, hedging essentially is taking an equal and opposite position to your physical trade on the futures market. And by entering into those hedges, those equal and opposite positions on the futures, it allows companies to become price agnostic. Um, and that doesn't mean they don't care about the price. Uh, you know, ask any finance department, they'll they'll prefer a price of $6,000 a ton for copper than $10,000 a ton. Um, but what it means is that once you've executed a hedge, your profit on that trade will no longer be affected by any subsequent movements in the price of that underlying commodity. Okay. So basically I have, I don't know, a shipment of whatever commodity for December. I have, I have this contract. I know the shipment is going to arrive. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to buy this physical commodity, I'm going to sell for December the future contract at yep. the same amount, at the, at the same amount of when I close my contract to make sure that if the price crashes or skyrocket, either end, I'm covered. So that's basically it, it. Exactly. I mean, and there are some nuances with you know time spreads and slightly different prices when you execute your hedge versus your physical contract. But kind of high level view, hedging is the equal and opposite position. So if you're buying physical, you're selling futures. If you're selling physical, you're buying futures and you're executing that hedge at the same price as your physical commodity. Can you explain one thing, which is when the contract arrive at um, expiration? So there's a lot of um, rumors, or I don't know if it was true or not, that some people got a delivery of a physical, the physical product because they hold the contract to, to, um, to expiration. Mm -hmm. But obviously, I don't see how this could be happening, but 
Anyhow, can you explain what happened when the future contract arrived at expiration? What are basically a rollover and what and how you can take deliveries? Yeah, sure. So um, the LME and the CME, the two markets that I discuss in the book, they're both what's known as physically backed exchanges. So what that means is that every futures contract that is traded on those exchanges, if held to expiry, becomes a physical obligation and those pieces of metal that back those futures contracts are called warrants. Now, most of the time, almost all of those futures contracts that are executed are not held until expiry. So, um, you know, you say you're short copper futures on the LME in June. What that means is that you will have until that expiration date. Um, so on the LME, most of the time people reference the third Wednesday, which is the most liquid trading day on the LME. It means that you will have until the last possible trading day is the day before um, when your position is known as what's, what's known as Tom trading. So you have tomorrow, the position is expiring. You only have up until that date to either square that position. So if you're short, execute a trade that buys back that uh, futures contract or roll that position, um, which is known as a carry trade or a spread trade. And so if you are short, and you wanted to move that short position to the following month, um, you'd be buying nearby and selling further out. That's known as a borrow. And if you are long nearby, so you bought futures and you didn't want to take delivery of metal, then you would look to move that position to the next month. And if you're selling nearby and buying the following month, that's known as a lend. And there are obviously costs or gains to be made with those trades and the levels at which those costs or um, gains will be made are set uh, by what's known as the forward curve. Um, so that is the varying prices for every single prompt date that exists that you could possibly roll that trade to. Okay, so and um, basically if the market, if the forward curve is up, each time you roll, you are losing money, right? Uh, so if you're if you're short and you roll a short position, yeah, yeah, dip on the side, right, yeah, right. And, the, 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 uh, so if price. uh, prices are rising with time, that's known as a contango. And so if you're short and you're borrowing, if you're borrowing a contango, you're going to make money. If you're long and you want to roll that position and you're lending in a contango, you're going to lose money because you're selling at a lower price and buying at a higher price. Yeah. So of course it dip on the side on the trade, but uh, okay, all right, and um, just. Can you explain what is the forward curve? Because uh, it's a concept which is, I mean, if you don't, <laughs> yeah. it's quite. Um, uh, okay, can you explain the link between the forward, future forward curve and the, what is happening on the physical side? Because I think this is what. Sure. So the forward curve itself is, um, you know, the kind of interchangeable name settlement date and prompt date uh, when you discuss metals. Um, at any given minute, second, hour, day, you can buy or sell a futures contract for a specific prompt or settlement date. Now, the forward curve is what defines the prices behind, let's say from LME, for example, if you are selling a contract versus May, June, July, August, you are very likely going to receive a different price when you execute that trade, depending on which prompt date you are asking for that futures contract to sit on. Now, the forward curve itself, whether it's in a contango or backwardation, uh, there's some kind of varying different influences on that curve. Some are just down to outright organic supply and demand. So historically, if the forward curve is in a very strong contango, what that implies is that there is a large amount of availability for that commodity because you know, why would someone pay more now in, you know, on a short term basis when there is plenty of metal around compared to a month, two months, three months later when metal availability is more unknown? So if that metal is deemed to be getting more scarce as time goes on, then that's what can lead to a, a large contango. A backwardation, obviously the opposite is true, um, typically around supply shocks where a larger metal amount of metal comes out of the market and people are suddenly scrambling for metal. So the price nearby at that nearby prompt date will increase because people are willing to pay more for metal today than they are in the future 
when those supply constraints may have eased. So they're the very typical um, kind of influences on the forward curve, but that's not to say that there aren't other factors that influence the forward curve, be it positioning, be it speculative uh, nature. Um, you know, the forward curve itself is very sporadic and can change you know, in an instant. Um, so often people will make the mistake of relying that, you know, we've been in a contango for months and not manage their positions correctly. And then the market will turn into a backwardation and they will be caught in a, you know, a losing situation. So when the, let's say the normal way of a market is the, a contango, because he said that if I buy two there, a uh, commodity and then I said I stuck it somewhere I pay for insurance financing blah, blah blah and I sell it on the future market in six months that should be the cost of carry right for the commodity from today to that's the theoretical value of the in, a, in a perfectly normal market yes I would say it actually works out like that not very often uh, <laughs> yeah, so this in, is the theory of paper in, right? yeah, in theory yeah. you know, but even in you know I've never seen a contango in a, you know, a 45 degree line, <laughs> even in a really healthy contango, prices will start to taper off, um, mainly due to lack of liquidity in those, the further out you, you want to trade, the less liquidity there is in those trades. And so the prices received will start to taper off. So that that's one question that I have for you, because, um, is there still a lot of people, I mean, is this, is this quite common for the big firms to do that type of trade? Okay, my storage capacity right now cost Y amount, and the, the price of six months is that. So is there a lot of carry trade like this? Or Yeah, it's, it's a huge amount. I mean, big yeah, firms okay. will uh, execute carry trades from the very short term. So Tom Next trading, where you trade one day at a time, okay. cash trading, so cash trades are two days um, from the execution date all the way through to, you know, people will do deck deck trades, jam deck trades, where, you know, if you know you're going to be carrying aluminium, zinc, lead, whatever it is, for an extended period of time, and you know that you have, you know, a, a book that takes you out a year, two years, then you will often see large trading firms execute, you know, six month carry trades, 12 month carry trades, so that they are protected against a backwardation or so that they can then capitalize if a backwardation happens and then they can lend into the backwardation and generate even more PL. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, now I, I, I have a question for you. So basically, your new job is a consultant for if I want to set up like an aging desk, I am a big producer of whatever commodity, I buy a lot of them. Yeah. My question to you is why should I edge myself? Because Let's give, let's, uh, I'll, I'll give you my, um, my view. If I'm buying every month the same amount of commodity, I go say, look, I don't really want to speculate, Samuel. I don't know why I should like uh, hedge myself. Every month I buy the same amount at the same time of the, and, and that's pretty much it. And of course, at the end of the day, I need to pay the market price. So why do I need to add a layer of complexity to my operation, which is edging, where I just can just, buy every month at the market price and that's pretty much it because at the end of the day i don't think i'm smart enough to to uh to play the market so i prefer to take the the price that the market is giving me do you think it's a right answer or i think it's a uh, i think it's a nuanced answer but my my response would be that by not hedging you are already playing the market because by not hedging you essentially you know if you're if you're selling a commodity if you're a a miner, for example, and you are selling concentrates. If you don't hedge, you're essentially taking the view that price is going to go up, right? Because if you thought they were going to go down, then that would you would draw you to hedge. So by not hedging, you you already are taking a view on the market. Now you could look at your cost curve and your cost of production and say, you know, I'm already making X, setting up a hedging desk and executing this and tracking it is going to be fairly substantial expense but we've all seen over the last few years how volatile prices can be so my my answer would be that hedging you know it takes the it takes the risk out of those prices um yes the price could go up and you could add to your PL, but if the prices come down then dollar for dollar you're going to be losing every dollar it comes down now 
there are different hedging strategies available. You know, you look at, you can look at outright hedges. You can look at the options market that gives you, you know, you're paying a premium to essentially protect yourself on downside or upside risk, but not hedging at all, I would say is a far greater risk than setting up and getting the people in place that have that knowledge to you know, guide that process to you know, mitigate that risk. And you know, a lot of this comes down to your, your, your financing banks. I assume they would prefer you to hedge to protect their investment um, than just be completely exposed to a price that you don't have any control over. That, 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 that last bit of answer, the fact that your financier will ask you, I mean, your lender, whatever, any other type of industry you are, you will have people that will lend you money. So yeah. they would prefer for you to hedge. That, yeah. that, that, uh, that, that's, I think, the, the best answer. Yeah, yeah, because you're completely right. Um, okay, and there is, uh, I don't know, like maybe a lot of market where you can hedge. There's a lot of market where there's like a future market, but there's no liquidity. So basically, the, you cannot really use it. So is it possible to add a product where the liquidity is not enough? Or you would say it's, it's possible to do it, but it's not wise to... It, to it's tough, right? In, in a very illiquid market, if you have an amount of commodity to hedge that is greater than the liquidity in the market, then if you try and do it, especially if you try and do it all at once, you're just going to drive the price against the levels at which you're trying to hedge. So yes, you can do it. You'd have to do it very slowly and over time to make sure you weren't moving the market against you. Um, but in often cases, the volume is just not there. Um, there are certain commodities that do trade on the LME, on the CME, where they're, they are really making a push to drive that liquidity so that hedging does become a tool that the producers, consumers, and traders of those products can utilize um, to protect themselves against the price risk. Yeah, it's cool. um, I, I had this issue because at the beginning of my career, I was a dairy trader. So we trade milk powder. Yeah. And it's uh, there is like a, an exchange in Europe with a very low liquidity, but the, the product is still traded. And we were always like that. Mm, maybe we should do something here. But each time we tried, I mean, the, it was impossible to get out of the of the, <laughs> of the position. And so we're like, yeah, oh, fuck that. <laughs> let, 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 let's not care. I think we even made money, but it was completely by chance, you know, because the, the market was so fucked up and <laughs> illiquid. But um, <laughs> it's uh, okay. Okay. Um, all right. Now there's another question that I wanted to, to ask you. Is like uh, a year ago now, the, the nickel market completely blew up. And on the LME, there was like, I don't know if you're big following commodity, it was like a big. Uh, a big headlines code that they basically like went back a few days and cancel a bunch of trade. So can you explain what happened at that moment? And how is that possible that, you know, they went back in time and said like, look, everyone that had holders during those few days, it's canceled. We, uh, we are go back, going back into the future. So sure. what, what happened exactly? I, uh, I actually do a case study on this particular event as part of uh, our training courses. So, yeah, I mean, this was a complete black swan event um, that happened to the LME. Um, and, you know, while they're unpredictable, systems can be put in place. Um, so yeah, this was back in March 2022. Uh, a Chinese nickel producer had essentially amassed a very large short futures position on the LME nickel contracts. And now the claim was that they were using this as a forward hedge um, against their production. But the position was such a size that you know people essentially realized what was going on and liquidity started coming out of the nickel market and because of that and this large short position that had amassed the price um, had started to increase very rapidly so on march 7th of 20 so can you can you can you explain sure. yeah. why when there is a large short position so price yeah. rise Historically, uh, if, if there is a very large short position and people can see that, you know, there's one or two holders of a short position, um, you know, it's you know, we, very different, but we saw the same thing happen on GameStop and the, the meme stocks, um, the, you know, the Wall Street bets where people saw these hedge funds have these short positions and decided that they're essentially going to push this, this price up. Um, so when that happens, you know, prices do generally start moving very quickly and very rapidly because at some stage the short holders are going to have to cover 
their position and so they need to purchase back exactly. so this is also why it is important like yeah. they are short but they need to buy to close their position so it's really stage, blow to yeah. infinity exactly now what happened in the case of nickel was that on march 7th prices went from thirty thousand dollars a ton to fifty five thousand dollars a ton in the course of one day so almost doubled now unfortunately at the time the lme didn't have any circuit breakers um, that would have kicked in and halted trading. So as the liquidity dried up, um, the price went higher and higher. And then even more, unfortunately, the market reopened at 1 a.m. London. So the LME trades from 1 a.m. London to 7 p.m. London time. And the issue is that at 1 a.m. London, there's barely you know any liquidity at all. So what happened was the price just gapped higher and higher and higher and you know single trades were moving the nickel market thousands of dollars a ton at a time mm. um, until the price reached above a hundred thousand dollars a ton so in the space of 24 hours the nickel price had more than tripled and by that point enough alarm bells had ring and i assume enough telephones had rung in london that they halted trading um, of the nickel contract so what followed was over a week of discussions at the LME with the Cat1 brokers, um, where several Cat1 bro brokers were essentially facing bankruptcy because of the margin calls that would have been made had the nickel price continued to, to increase um, because you know all of those brokers were holding short positions at $20,000, $30,000 a ton. And so- Those, those they, guys are the brokers of the- Chinese, uh, uh, exactly. uh, buyer, uh, the Chinese producer, right? Exactly. So, you know, they were facing variation margin of sixty, seventy thousand dollars a ton on these nickel contracts that they were holding. So, the LME then made the decision to cancel all trades that were made on March eighth. So, any trade that from fifty thousand all the way through to just over a hundred thousand dollars a ton was cancelled. And essentially, the LME's reasoning was that the market was disorderly and multiple companies, potentially even the contract itself, you know, would have faced disarray and had those trades been allowed to stand. Now, even when on March 16th, so over a week later, the LME turned on the contract, they added um, circuit breakers. So the addition of limit up and down circuit breakers trading still wasn't functioning properly because you know everyone wanted to sell at that highest price and barely anyone wanted to buy so what would happen and this went on for four days that the market would open limit down you know five contracts went off five lots and it would immediately halt because the lower circuit breaker had been triggered trading would halt for the next 24 hours it would open up the next day same thing would happen so until the price reached the levels that it had actually started at on March 7th, there was barely any liquidity in the market. And, you know, eventually some semblance of normalcy, you know, came back into the market, but the price had to basically come back down to where it had begun on March 7th. And at that point, you know, volume started to flow. So a few kind of, results of that event um, there are now circuit breakers across all lme contracts which are currently 12 percent up and down for aluminium and copper and 15 percent for all of the other metals um, but importantly the nickel contract itself has still not fully recovered to the volume that it had been trading prior to that event very recently you know volumes i would say have reached similar levels um, over the last month or so but, you know, brokers are very cautious about extending credit on particularly variation margin, um, given the possibility of defaults. And, you know, at the time, they were even very wary of accepting new short positions um, at all. So, you know, it was potentially a struggle for people, especially uh, traders who are typically long physical before they then sell it, short futures, yeah. naturally short futures. Um, you know, it was it was potentially a bit of a struggle to actually get those 
hedges off. And another thing that happened was brokers or some brokers were limiting or not guaranteeing um, second ring prices or closing prices on the LME because the reasoning was that, you know, if you come in with 100, 200, 500 lot order, but less lots than that actually trade on that closing price, it's we're essentially going to have to take price risk on that fill if if we guarantee that price for you. So, you know, those changes have have dissipated by now. As I say, the volume recently has come back and um, I haven't heard of anyone not guaranteeing uh, closing orders. But at the time it was it was real trouble. Um, so, you know, other exchanges have definitely seen volumes pick up. Um, where some people lost some faith um, in that contract. Um, yeah, so I can, I can, I can, I can be. I mean, I, I, because I have a lot of traders friend, and uh, a few of them um, work with Nikkei, and they said, "Man, this. I mean, how? What can we do now? We we cannot use this contract because at any time we can get uh, liquidated. We 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 don't even know what is going to happen. Yeah. And also another part is like a lot of people are using uh, this is for the audience, but a lot of people are using the enemy price." For their own contract, even though they are not edge, they don't care, but they use it as an indicator for the price of their product or whatever. And yeah. they said, "Now, how can you explain to your client? Yeah, we are going not going to use the high price, but you know the middle price. Ah, this is that yeah. was a very very tough moment." Now, uh, I mean, in in the LME's defense, they were in a really tough position because you know it really was an event that no one was no one was expecting, um, and they have now put in place these circuit breakers, so it really should be very difficult for that same kind of to happen again. Happen again. Um, there's certain elements in place that would prevent it. Um, and, you know, even the, those counterparties who took legal action against the LME haven't been successful in those um, arguments so far. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that at this stage, the volume is coming back and... Um, but Nickel, I guess Nickel is still a small... I mean, yeah, I mean there's not a lot of... Um, Compared market. to the, the outright tonnage volume, the nickel market compared to you know things like copper and aluminium is significantly smaller, but it is also a key part of the energy transition when you look at EVs. Um, so you know the demand is going to still be there, um, and it is even more important to if you are going to hedge, understand how that market works and what options are available to you because in my opinion at least the volatility is only going to increase over the next few years oh yeah oh yeah definitely <laughs> that's that's for sure all right uh so th thanks for the explanation so um now i have another uh trade that i want to, uh, you to to explain is like it's right it's happening right now on the aluminium market mm -hmm. where there is uh, the LME as i know the problem is like they have a lot of russian origin aluminium in their storage, I think like something like 90% of the product is from Russia. Mm -hmm. And they just basically said they just basically said that they cannot accept more Russian product um, in the world. So it created like two-tier market, mm -hmm. Russian origin and other Western accepted origin, let's say. So but the, there is like a very interesting trade that the big trade girls are actually I did. I don't know if it's still open or not, but they just can you can you explain what what uh, sure. the, the situation? Uh, yeah as you mentioned um as of april 13th of this year uh because of the new sanctions implemented by the us and the uk the lme banned new or they banned warranting of fresh production so any russian metal that was produced as of april 13th of this year uh you could not deliver it to the exchange um any longer in the form of warrants now, metal produced prior to that date, so April 12th and prior, of which, as you mentioned, there are currently hundreds of thousands of tons in the LME, um, that material is still tradable under the sanctions. However, the, there are now two tiers, two types of warrants. So one type one material is freely available to be traded by UK, US counterparts, as long as it was warranted before um, that, that April 13th cutoff. The type two is material that was produced before um, that, at that April 13th cutoff, but was um, it hasn't been warranted. So fresh warrants that go in as type two, 
there are different rules and regulations about who is able to trade them. So UK counterparties cannot trade them. They have to trade them for outside of US and UK counterparties. So essentially what it does is type two warrants, type two metal that are sitting on the LME is going to be less in demand. So the likelihood is that it will stay in the warehouse for a much longer period of time than other brands or type one material. Now, something that's been happening for years and years and years is that warehouses will often incentivize traders to deliver tons to them um, because they know that they're going to generate a certain amount of LME rent. Now, rent on an LME warehouse is typically a lot more expensive than a non-LME warehouse. You might pay three, four dollars a ton in a non-LME warehouse. LME warehouse rent is you know, 15 and a half dollars per ton per month. So often what will happen, a trader will approach a warehouse and say, I will deliver in you X amount of tonnage. If you agree to split that $15 a ton with me per month for the life of that warrant. Ah, okay. So, so basically the trader goes and says, the LME pays the warehouse. $15 a month. The LME doesn't pay the warehouse, the broker who's holding the warrant. Okay. Um, the, the okay. Warehouse. The owner of the warrant pay the, the warehouse $15, which is three times more expensive than a yeah. normal for normal cargo. Yeah. So the traders go and say, look, man, we split the margin. Yeah. So basically, I'm going to deliver a shitload of product to your warehouse, but you need to pay me. Yeah. That's basically and the idea. So essentially, by converting this metal from type one to type two, it's likely to remain in the warehouse for a longer period of time and essentially generate more income for both the warehouse and for the trader if they have what's known as a rent share deal um, active. Now, this is different from, you know, going back a decade when the aluminium warehouse uh, situation was happening. That was different because that was just a pure queue based income generation. So, you know, you could cancel a warrant and you might have to wait a year to access that metal. Yeah, so, okay, so this is the other story with the carousel trade, where they just basically... basically uh, with the aluminium, the warehouse had, you know, so many millions of tons, and the demand was there that there, there might be a million ton queue in order to get the metal out. The warehouse is only obligated to deliver out, you know, a few thousand tons per day. So every fresh ton the warehouse could incentivize into the warehouse, they knew they were getting at least a year's plus worth of rent. So that, oh, that drove up yeah. alley premiums and it was a whole thing. Um, now the LME since then has introduced rules that cap in a queue situation, the amount of rent a warehouse can earn on a piece of metal once it's been canceled. So that exists to an extent, but far less than it used to this kind of um, trade is much more just in the hopes that no one will cancel this. So it's less reliant on the queue in the warehouse and more reliant on the fact that there are less traders and consumers that can access this material. Therefore, it's just likely to stay in the warehouse longer. And every month it stays in, the warehouse and the traders are generating revenue. Help me, so help me to understand that. So on aluminium right now, what did the... Um... The price uh, today like, per ton, uh, you know, twenty. I'll pull it up. Uh, I'll pull it up. Give you a live yeah, price. Yeah, me, me, metric ton. <laughs> uh, so twenty five fifty five is current three okay. price. So and so the trader is still making money by getting five bucks a month. Yeah, five. And with, and on top of that, the cost of financing and any other cost. Well, no, they so once, once they deliver into the exchange, they're no longer financing that metal. Uh, Okay. Oh, yeah. right. That was, yeah. that was the part that made no sense to me because I was like, man, there's still someone which which is, who are paying for that the product, but no. Yeah. If the trade yeah. happens to finance yeah. at six, seven, eight percent financing rates. Yes, it's... exactly. So I was like, how is that possible? I don't get it. As, now soon I, you, yeah, it... as soon as you deliver into the exchange, you're delivering to a broker who's then holding yeah. that warrant and they are financing it. Um, and the, the trader is no longer holding that warrant. They're just collecting this rent in perpetuity yeah. for as long as that warrant remains at that warehouse. All right. All right. Now it makes sense to me because I was like, how, how is that possible? Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. So, uh, second, second question that I have. Um, so I read your book. I took a lot of notes. And there is one type of trade um, with warrant, which is called shifting, shifting, shifting. So can you shift yeah. it? So can you explain what is it? Because if you are not like really deep into the weed, I mean you've never heard of that, and I think that was quite interesting. Sure. So sifting is so step back a little bit. So warrants, various different warrants will trade at various different premiums depending on geographical location or brands. Um, certain brands or location will command a higher premium than others. Now, you can, if you want, just pay a premium to the warrant holder to get that specificity to buy a certain brand in a certain location. However, if you have the financing to do so, you can what's known as sift warrants, whereby you would pick up an extremely large amount of warrants. Let's say you you borrow a thousand lots, so you're trying to pick up 25,000 tons of aluminium or copper, for example. You let that forward position expire, that long position, and you will be delivered a thousand lots of warrants against that long position when you let it expire. Now, when that happens, you will be sent a Excel sheet of the list of all thousand lots or 25,000 tons, and you can quickly sift through that list, see essentially if there are any premium warrants available, anything that you don't want to keep, you can then lend that position back, create a short position, deliver him back in, and keep essentially by paying no premium for any of those warrants that you value, that you then think that you can sell at a much higher premium in the physical consumption market. So it's essentially a way that large traders can avoid paying physical premiums to warrant holders um, to try and get that specific metal um, that they would otherwise have to pay over and above for. Um, so it's not without risk. There are risks, you know, spread trading risks because you have to establish that position. And if that spread moves against you in between putting your length on and then delivering it back, it can cost money. Um, if you have to, you know, you don't act quickly enough, you have to hold that metal, you're still financing that metal for every day until you can deliver the bulk of that back in, um, which is obviously not cheap. You're paying LME rent on that a thousand lots or how many lots you sift with um, for every day you hold it. So, you know, you wouldn't want to sift over a Thursday or Friday because then you'd be paying rent and finance over the weekend. Um, you'd ideally want to sift where you could borrow initially in a contango so it wasn't costing you. Yeah, so that was what I was going to say. So to if the market is on the contango, then it's quite interesting because you can speculate on the uh with the product that you are going basically to sell it back uh, again yeah so there are there is a risk there are ways to mitigate those risks um, but it is really only available to those with the larger um financing uh balance sheets um because you know to sift correctly you need to pick up a lot of material if you pick up 10 lots 20 lots then a broker is going to deliver you the worst warrants that no nobody wants um because you just let a long position expire all right. And so also just for to make sure that people understand is like we are talking about commodity, but there's still some commodity that can be sold at premium for whatever reason, for origin, for I, exactly. I don't know why. So, so um, you know, traders of metal that do hedge the, the outright price risk, they're not making a margin off of the difference in price. They're making a difference for refined metals in the difference in premiums over and above the underlying price of that commodity. So aluminium, if it's trading at $200 a ton premium in warehouse and you can make a sale for $300 delivered to your customer, essentially you've got $100 a ton to, if you can get it from point A to point B for less than that $100 a ton in additional costs, you know, then you're going to make money over and above that $200 a ton premium you paid for the metal. Yeah, that makes sense. But and, and now I, I have a question for, about this warrant trade mm -hmm. because everything that uh, I've seen about those type of trades, the margin are so, so small and the uh, amount of financing required is huge. So I guess only there's like maybe a handful of players that can really 
move things in those markets just because of the requirement to be able to trade them. I mean, it, it, really correct depends, or not that much? it really depends on the size you're doing as well. I would say for, for large amounts of warrants, because of the financing, there's very few you know, companies, traders who can utilize warrants in that fashion where you are talking, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of lots at a time. Um, but for smaller amounts, you know, five lots, 10 lots, 20 lots here and there, I would say that small traders regularly um, utilize the LME for that function um, and, and a part of that process. Okay, okay, Samir. So and now can you um, explain what you do at Perfectly Edge? Uh, what, yeah, what, 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 what type of service do you offer? And also can you talk to us about uh, what are in, uh, inside your book? Sure. So um, Perfectly Hedged uh, LLC, I say I set it up um, last October and it's it's two parts. Uh, the first part you just held up um, is the book and it really is a, a guide um, to hedging, um, you know, taking that complex subject and breaking it down piece by piece into you know, utilizing everyday situations that I've seen in my career that I know that you know, that middle and back office function are going to have to navigate throughout their careers. Um, maybe even worth a look at for some of the front office who want to brush up on their uh, on their knowledge. Um, so that that book is available. And then the other yeah. So let me let me sell that book. So I, I've been trading you know concentrate and scrap metals. Uh, so yeah, for for a while now. And there's always like do, those things when you speak with real you know i buy from very small producer or basically there's like a price for the product and that's it you know it, that, that it. but when you sell to like a proper buyer mm -hmm. there's always going to be like some type of jargon that is quite difficult to understand if you are not uh if you if you don't understand what they are talking about yeah. for instance chupi like mm -hmm. what is a quotation period yeah. there's a jargon okay 18 percent of that product for that like, so there's like yeah i thought i think it if you trade a little bit of metal and you want to really understand what is going on, I think this book really helps because it's a great summary and it explains all the typical jargon that. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, you would feel a bit ashamed to ask what is going on, but I think it's important that you that you understand. It. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as you say, there's there is a lot of jargon in this industry, um, and often, uh, unfortunately, people don't spend the time to really develop those basics. And then that prevents them from understanding those more complex sets, you know, situations that are definitely going to occur. So if you can, you know, from, from the beginning of your career, or maybe you've been in it a few years, really develop those, those basic, uh, you know, knowledge, um, it's really going to serve you well for that next step. And also the price calculation, this is something that people, especially in concentrate, people don't really get, you know, that is not that as straightforward. You need really to understand what is going on. Yeah. And so, uh, because. Three months ago, I had like an argument with one of my partner when I said, look, man, we are losing money on that trade. No, no, we are making, man, your Excel sheet is wrong. We are losing money. Yeah. And you know, at the end, so just because the, the, the calculation was just, uh, of the product was just not yeah. right. So that's, uh, that's, yeah, so that's quite uh, important to know. So yeah. this is for the book. And, and I think then, uh, also you have a, a, a discount code for us, right? Yes. Um, yes. I will put the link below if you want to order this book and uh, there's going to be a discount code. So, um, yeah. Perfect. Um, so yeah, discount code for any of your, uh, your viewers, it'll be the word interview. Um, and as you say, it'll be, uh, the link will be there. And so the other side of the business is a consulting business and it is really wide ranging, but, uh, the first aspect is that we go in and teach essentially the content of the book. Um, it's, it's covers the book and some other subjects. Um, and really impart that knowledge um, into these companies uh, where, you know, as I say in the book, it's often the people who have the most experience at a company have the least amount of time to sit and spend with these people that need to have that knowledge. So we come in and we go from A to Z. It can be entirely bespoke, tailored to individual companies' needs, and we cover those wide ranging subjects when it comes to hedging and you know, really add that tangible value to those employees. Um, aside from that, you know, if a company is looking to set up a hedging desk, run risk cards, you know, learn more about that. We, uh, we facilitate relationships with brokers for those who do want to set up hedging. Um, you know, we do also look at 
financing trades, so hedged repos and things like that to uh, reduce people's balance sheets. And you know, given my background, I can also speak to physical trading, derivative trading, um, so a lot of ad hoc consultancy as well. Uh, but the, the primary part of it is that in, in person uh, or online um, teaching of hedging to students, to staff members um, who, who want to add that tangible value to their companies and don't necessarily have the outlet to do so. Perfect, man. So thanks a lot, Samuel. Again, all uh, below this video, you will find all the link. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks a lot for your time. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me, Damien. It was a pleasure.